So we now have the panel discussion. If I can invite the previous speakers and uh, Peter Abiel, who will be uh, giving, giving the second keynote speech uh, after the break. And it's my pleasure to introduce the, um, the moderator, Patricia Kovacs uh, from Mount Sinai. She's the Senior Associate Dean for Scientific Computing and Data Science. And I also want to thank her. She made some great suggestions for several of our speakers at this conference. Patricia. Okay, well, I'm so excited to be here uh, and with all these fantastic speakers. And I was thinking perhaps we could start, if you could introduce yourself just briefly because the audience doesn't know you. Sure, hi, I'm uh, Peter Abiel. I was scheduled to talk this morning, but somebody else had to rush off early and we got swapped, so I'll be talking later today. Um, I'm a professor at Berkeley. Uh, I'm also founder of a company called Covariant. Uh, in both places, I work on artificial intelligence for robotics. Okay, and I don't know, I want to encourage any questions uh, from the audience for the folks that you've already heard. Um, but I'll get started with some questions now. So, I mean, obviously we're a very diverse panel, robotics and <laughs> computational genomics and ecology, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're a diverse cross-cutting panel. So um, some of the questions are, I mean, perhaps we could just start very simply, like what motivated you to learn about AI? And, um, you know, how did you get started? What path would you recommend to others in the community? So I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Georgia? <laughs> I can go first. Um, actually, my whole career has been in artificial intelligence. Um, I'm old enough, the oldest, I guess, in the panel, to have seen um, the previous um, growth of artificial intelligence in the 90s, the subsequent stagnation, and now what I consider the renaissance. And it was artificial intelligence that I did, one of the uh, pioneering studies in nuclear medicine, training artificial neural networks for uh, lesion detection in single photon emission computed tomography and all that. So it's been a very interesting ride and I had the opportunity to see how, uh, to see what I call the hope, the hype, and the hard truth. Uh, because it's, there is certainly a lot of hope when there is a new movement, uh, exciting science, innovation, uh, a lot of the publicity is driven by the hype. Uh, we don't do as scientists uh, due diligence. And then we learn the hard lessons when we try to integrate the technology in the biomedical space, which is what I went through, as well as my generation with computer-aided uh, diagnostic technologies in radiology. Uh, so I hope that this next generation will learn from the mistakes of the past because a lot of the topics that we discussed yesterday about the quality of the ground truth, about integration in workflows, um, uh, all of these issues, um, uh, the human-computer interaction, which is extremely important, all of these issues were some of the uh, failures, I would say, uh, during the previous um, wave. Um, so you know, my background is, is not in AI. In fact, I started my career in, in experimental physics and then somehow became a penguin biologist, and, and now I do what I, I do now. Um, but my, my advice for students is always that you don't have to learn uh, your second career the way you learned your first career. Uh, so we think of learning as having to be very linear, and it kind of starts with the introductory textbook and then you know the 200, then the 300 level class. Um, but uh, you know, as a more senior scholar, uh, you, you learn by osmosis, and so uh, you know, my, my strategy has been to surround myself with excellent, intelligent, and very patient collaborators and uh, graduate students that are, are willing to uh, kind of teach me the new language as we collaborate together on some of these projects. And I think um, particularly as you get on in your career, that's, uh, that's the most efficient way, um, you know, as opposed to going back to school, which many of us can't afford to do. So I'd say as, a, as director of precision medicine at Cornell, um, the fit between AI and you know, personalized medicine, I think, is a very natural fit. Uh, we've actually been doing AI for many years. Uh, we have not always called it AI. Uh, we used to call it machine learning, but you know, I think um, personalized medicine is really uh, learning from many applying to one. And you know, we have opportunities now to learn uh, from you know, very large cohorts. Uh, we do a lot of work with the UK Biobank, which, which has half a million individuals fully genotyped, fully phenotyped. Uh, really an amazing resource for learning how to connect genotypes and phenotypes. 
And so that's what we do uh, you know, on a routine basis now uh, to try to make those connections and then apply it to individual patients uh, after, after having loved. So it's a very natural fit for us. Yeah, for me, the reason I got started is, well, first I found everything really interesting. Everything I ever studied I thought was exciting. Um, and then I had to pick something to have some kind of specialty. And it just seemed like if I had to pick one thing, it's like understanding the human brain. But understanding the human brain seems so complex and there's no good measurements available. So what's the best proxy for that kind of effort? It seemed, okay, trying to engineer something like it seems like it'd be the best way to at least do something somewhat similar where we can make some progress more quickly. Um, in terms of how to get started these days, I think there's just different kinds of AI you can do. So one thing is um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, the Google and Facebook kind of software to build uh, neural net models is becoming more and more accessible. And so if you have a little bit of a math and computer science background, it's not too hard to start playing with those. And uh, that's a pretty good way to get started, uh, do those tutorials. Um, if you want to get into research, um, the interesting thing is that almost all AI classes are available freely online, where you can just go watch the lectures from pretty much any school and look at the homework and start working on it. Oh, very good. Um, Dr. Mendelson? Sure. First, thank you to the whole panel. It was a very interesting session. My question is directed to uh, Georgia Tarasi. Um, so de-identifying narrative data for collaborative research remains a big challenge. Perfect is not perfect enough, apparently. <laughs> Um, with that said, um, there's another technique that's uh, rising in the literature, hide in plain sight. Have you had the opportunity to intermix that with um, your machine learning technology? Yes, actually, this is the, uh, the standard practice at many medical centers. Obviously, uh, since we're a national laboratory, we abide by the data use agreements and what are the expectations. Um, this is not part of our um, project to de-identify data. This is part of how NCI and the cancer registries want to, to go about the problem. Uh, we reached the privacy preserving point when we started having these successes with the models. And the models, it's open technology from our end, from the Department of Energy, it belongs to the data owners, but then the data owners themselves, how they share the model, that's where the, the conversation started. And I'm sure you know that it is not just the science, it's the legal aspects of science. Um, and there are lots of complexities uh, when these conversations take place and who will assume the legal responsibility of failure for any technique applied. Thank you. Um, and we have another question. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm a PhD student at Sinai. Um, my question is for Olivier. Um, so when you, oh, my bad. this is working properly. Um, when you get these targets that you, if you eventually you have this compound, you don't know what it's going to bind to and you, you figure it out, do you sometimes get multiple hits and so you're able to like better predict maybe what the side effects of your drug will be? Um, or potentially like if it could have multiple uses, so say this drug that you're gonna to use to treat a brain cancer like might have, be able to be used for neurological diseases. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, every drug, almost every drug, you know, binds to multiple targets. So you know, the method that I presented has the potential to give you a list of targets, not one target. It gives you a ranked list of targets. Mm -hmm. The higher, you know, sort of uh, ranked uh, targets are the ones that are more likely to bind, but then you can go down the list. And then use information about the other targets, like you say, you know, to predict potential side effects. Um, side effect prediction is also a very difficult problem in general uh, as we develop drugs. We just don't have a good way to predict ahead of time, or we didn't have a good way to predict ahead of time whether a molecule is going to be toxic when you give it to, to a person, to, to, you know, to a human. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in that space. Uh, again, likewise, building predictive models to predict toxicity in humans. Uh, you know, ahead of time, even before giving the molecule to a person, can you actually look at the molecule, you know, like you say, look at the potential target, predicted targets, you know, the shape of the molecule, the suitability, you know, and so on. Can you actually make predictive models that predict well uh, toxicity? We actually, we've shown that it's feasible. We've shown that using machine learning, learning from the many, 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 you know, hundreds, thousands of molecules that have toxicity documented, we can actually connect uh, molecules to toxicity patterns. And, and we published on this, and, and this is also very important as part of the, the approach to help speed up how we develop drugs. Okay. 
Oh, Dr. Orman? I have a question that's mainly directed at Professor Beal, and it's, um, you know, a lot of the research that the panelists do is constrained by the available data. But, you know, one of your areas of expertise in deep reinforcement learning, you know, you see a lot of the major advances in the past couple of years being bound by compute. I guess my question for you is, what do you see as the role for academic researchers and universities in tackling problems in deep reinforcement learning, knowing that it's hard to compete with industrial groups where compute is a lot more scarce in the academic setting? Yeah, so it's definitely the case in reinforcement learning. You generate your own data by running simulations, so compute gives you data. Um, and some of the biggest experiments use an insane amount of data. If you look at uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero, the amount of computation that was required, or OpenAI's Dota 2. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure those experiments have necessarily given more insight than some of the other work that's actually required far less compute. I would say those works are really interesting because they show us if you just scale things up massively, where are we with today's technology? But they don't necessarily tell us the next steps. And so I think a lot of the academic research is more focused on what are the new ideas that we can already see signs of life, often in smaller experiments. We can already identify that there is a sign of life without running it in a big experiment that will necessarily capture New York Times headlines, but actually scientifically will be just as interesting in terms of making progress. That said, even in academia, we need to use a good amount of compute to run those experiments. And I should say that a lot of big companies are very generous in terms of uh, providing cloud compute cycles to do this kind of research. Not at the level you know, of an AlphaGo Zero experiment, but at a level that allows us to do the work that we want to do. Thank you. If I may make a <laughs> comment, I can see I suspect, you. yeah, go on, go on. Um, uh, for those who are not familiar, the Department of Energy uh, runs a number of leadership computing facilities that are open to the scientific community. And um, these days, uh, I'm sure you probably have heard that the fastest supercomputer in the world, uh, Summit, sits at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and it is open for use for scientists. The problem that I presented to you, we have been the guinea pigs for bringing in uh, deep learning frameworks to support the needs of the different scientists. So all you need to do, this is free compute time, you just need to write a proposal to request time. It is a competitive mechanism. There are different types of programs depending on your needs, but you can go to um, uh, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility website and file a proposal there. And it's a, it is, depending on the mechanism and how much you ask for, it can be a fairly quick review. And right now, because Summit, it is tailored for AI applications and it is open for a more diverse application domains. Biomedical domain has not been the main field, of course. For DOE, um, there is a lot of uh, desire to bring a broader user community in the mix. Cool. Happy to give you more information in person. Cool. Um, please. Uh, I'm Gabriel Avgerinos from Energy Mentors and NYU. Uh, excuse my question because I'm a layperson, I'm a chemical engineer, uh, but my question is linked to the research that I'm doing that is trying to tie orphan diseases as well as diseases that come from use of dirty fossil fuels such as pulmonary diseases. So my question really is, to what extent can AI be used for addressing orphan diseases that don't have a very big target that pharma likes? And can you put a little bit more light to the monoclonal versus polyclonal argument and how AI can be helpful there? Thank you. I think maybe the question's sure. for you. I'm I happy to, uh, to help address this. Um, well, you know, I think the, the the key again, I mean, is, as always, is to try to focus on the biology. I mean, the, the approach we're taking with AI is really very much a, a biology-driven AI approach where we use AI as a way to help understand mechanisms of actions, to understand how drugs, you know, work in people, you know, what um, makes a good target, uh, you know, what's driving a specific disease. That's not only AI, this is also using the genomics work we're doing. So you know my my sort of um, my my approach in general is to combine you know measurements um, very deep sort of type of measurements using you know 
side of using genomics sequencing, using expression profiling to really um, make as many characterizations possible of a disease, then use AI as a way to integrate all this information. And that's how I would uh, sort of explore these uh, type of angles is, you know, do we understand the biology behind this disease? Once we do, then we can deploy the large amount of AI-driven sort of type of models that we have to help to potentially target, you know, the mechanisms that we find. Uh, so that's just, you know, sort of one angle. When it comes to cancer and to the polyclonal sort of things, I mean, that's also a very important question. You know, every cancer is, in fact, a population of cells. Many of them have different uh, mutations. What we do, uh, you know, more and more is to try to understand this heterogeneity of uh, different clones, you know, in, in disease, the extent to which different cells have different mutations. Um, we do try to understand this heterogeneity to map it out, but we also look at to see what's common between those different cells, you know, that have, um, that come from the same original, you know, uh, cancer cell. And, you know, what's common typically is what we would like to target more than what's maybe specific to individual cell populations. Uh, so that's kind of the approach we're taking, but there's more and more of a, a need in the future for a kind of a single cell approach, single, you know, very high resolution mapping of these clones that you mentioned. Please. So um, we already heard Peter basically give an example of how to generate, you know, uh, labeled data by simulations. Now, medicine and uh, also your field, it's really hard to get get a lot of experts, right? I mean, in, in medical field, expert time is, is really scarce, um, and if you are one of the few experts, so so what are the ways out? How how do you solve this, tackle this problem, getting actually high quality labels? So I can speak a little bit uh, to that. Um, one of the strategies that ecologists have been using increasingly are, is citizen science or uh, crowd crowd sharing. Um, that that has worked. One of the things we're struggling with is that uh, this is not like teaching someone what a cat or a dog looks like. So you're talking about a lot of data, but it's super low quality, and 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 right now it just hasn't been worth it. Um, it's been better to just sink some real expert time into a really high quality annotated data set. Um, or this kind of weak annotation where you, you might have uh, data that are annotated at a different resolution or, or something. For example, um, maybe we know what kinds of habitat pack ice seals like and we can inject th those so-called habitat suitability models uh, into our uh, deep learning models. You know, so we're taking, we're just trying to codify expert information to shortcut needing a huge ton of, of labeled high resolution data. Um, but certainly that idea of crowd sharing or, or citizen science um, works in some applications uh, better than others. Can we crowdsource medical data? Well, there's all the patients like me and other things, but I'll let other folks uh, I'm sure have. Yeah, I would say this. certainly yeah. uh, that's why we're pursuing semi-supervised learning and weekly labeled um, artificial intelligence approaches because that problem will always be there. Actually, it's not only access to expert annotators, but in order to be one, well, to increase the quality of the annotation, we have to make sure that we have at least two mm -hmm. expert annotators per case and a way to uh, deal with disagreement. That's the standard practice in medical applications, but that doesn't scale. You're absolutely right. Uh, the way we've been approaching the problem in uh, cancer surveillance, um, we are dealing, we are training systems with a sufficient number of highly, you know, annotated data, but also with uh, data that has what we call a bronze standard. But then the actual validations, validations happen with higher annotation data. That's always uh, how the validation should happen. And there is an iterative process with error auditing, right? You develop your model. Uh, you look at the errors, the patterns of error, and you go back and forth to further improve the process. So when, when, oh, I'm sorry. To uh, you know, to, coming back to what was mentioned earlier about generative data, one of the things that we've been trying to do are build generative models that we can generate data that we, we know, um, you know, have the characteristics that, that we want. And that allows us to share satellite imagery that otherwise we wouldn't be allowed to share. So basically private satellite imagery, if we can generate 
uh, fake satellite imagery that is good enough to fool a human annotator. That's something that we can both use to train our models and something that we can share more broadly. And so I think there's a lot of potential. Um, I know people are working on that in a healthcare context where you can uh, gen uh, use generative models to generate data that actually isn't from a person um, and, and you know what it was you intended to generate. Yeah, actually, this is a very good point because the synthetic data generation is another movement in the AI community, mm -hmm. exactly for uh, applications where people cannot share openly data. Then the question comes to what extent the synthetic generation, uh, the synthetically generated data capture all the covariates that are typically present in the biomedical application and with, at which point you can reverse engineer the system and open it to adversarial use. So there is always uh, a cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done with everything. But that's an actually extremely active field of research because we see that uh, the privacy concerns will remain. Um, uh, we cannot move fast enough liberating data. And this is considered one of the possible ways for what I call responsible liberation of data. Well, then in this context, what arises, of course, is how to to evaluate, uh, basically, um, how w how do you relate that to a real-world use um, in terms of accuracy and so on? Well, what is done these days is uh, essentially what is the purpose of synthetic data, right? To train a reliable model in the end that you can deploy. Uh, so the only way to test it is train a model with the synthetic data, train a model with the actual data, and then test it on an actual validation set that sits aside. And if you see that the behavior of the models um, is similar by some statistical metrics that need to be defined, um, not just an overall performance, then you feel comfortable that the synthetic data captures the properties that are important for the clinical problem in your hands. Can I just comment briefly? I mean, I'd just like to make the argument that I don't think medicine lacks uh, labeled data. In fact, there's actually a tremendous amount of labeled data you know, in medicine. Every, you can make the case that every piece of data in medicine is actually labeled because you know, a physician has looked at it uh, you know, and, and recorded some information about it. I think the issue is that you know, the labels uh, are not always um, extremely accurate. There's you know, a lot of variability between individuals. And the labels are not always easy to access. You know, there's actually a tremendous amount of label data, but it's stored within medical systems, within EHRs that you know, you know, essentially don't make it easy for that data to be extracted and used for research, used to train, you know, sort of personalized, you know, let's say, you know, AI models. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to change. I think we need to need we need to move towards you know more learning systems where the data can be extracted, the data can be used. You know, we can learn from the data. Across, potentially across multiple medical centers. Uh, that's the direction that medicine is taking, and I think this is, I think, the, uh, the, the direction that it should take. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miola? Hi, my name is John Miola. I work with uh, Patricia in Scientific Computing. My question is, uh, Georgia, um, you're working on NLP. What type of hardware are you using? What type, well, first of all, I guess the amount of data that you're, you're working with. Uh, and what type of hardware and, and storage are you using? I, I, as a systems administrator, that's something I would be uh, like to know. Thank you. Yes. So when we started this uh, project, obviously the data did not come in in one big chunk. Uh, we did most of the experiments um, uh, in our PHI enclave, which at the time had the NVIDIA boxes. Uh, right now, the experiments have moved to uh, Summit Supercomputer because it gives us the opportunity to do hyperparameter optimization of these models at scale that is not possible otherwise. Uh, the data set size uh, that we have right now is um, with the, well, the experiment that I showed you had two registries, as I mentioned, for training cross-validation inside um, the lab, which was approximately 600,000 uh, pathology reports. As of the past month, uh, we have two more registries that joined uh, the program, New Jersey and uh, Utah, and that has more than doubled um, the data that we have available inside uh, the enclave. Um, so yes, because this is a program that is supported by the Department of Energy, it is one of the exemplar projects for testing the summit 
environment and building different uh, types of uh, neural networks that have different needs. We do have access to some very unique resources, but as I said earlier, uh, this environment is also now available to uh, all the scientists. It's an open environment. So I'd like to encourage more questions from the audience, but uh, in the absence of that, I mean, we were talking a little bit about data quality. I would love to hear, have any of you ever had any issues with data quality? And if so, how did you find it? And what do, how do you validate your results? Um, would love to hear, have you share some of your experiences with that? Absolutely. <laughs> there is no clean data. <laughs> um, even in the cancer registry program, um, even with the manual abstractors, uh, the quality of data has been questioned several times because when you do this error edit auditing process that I mentioned earlier, and you t go back to the experts and you say, we try to understand why the system made an error in these you know, 10 cases, inevitably, I, I shouldn't be quoting that, a 20% error, it was human error. It goes back that the actual abstraction had some uh, error itself, or if you presented that same case to three, four different regis registrars, they will disagree among themselves. So certainly what we call a gold standard, it's not gold. And actually the, the most challenging cases, clinical cases, are always at the intersection. Um, so I would go back to uh, accept that our data will always be big and dirty. Uh, take that as an opportunity to learn models that may not be the best, but are certainly much more robust in the broader environment because, you know, with a semi, with a bronze gold standard, you may not get the highest accuracy, but you will get a built-in robustness in the system in terms of generalizing and absolutely be very meticulous with error uh, auditing, error analysis in every step of the process. So, so with satellite data, uh, we have all sorts of errors, uh, clouds and shadows and all sorts of uh, things that can corrupt the data. But one of the things that we've been focused on is making sure that when we're talking about the quality of our predictions, that we're not comparing it to perfect because we don't know what perfect is, uh, but that it, we compare it to uh, disagreements among multiple expert annotators and it turns out that what we've realized is that expert annotators are themselves really lousy. And so we shouldn't, in some sense, hold AI up to the standard which we cannot ourselves meet. And so, you know, the question is not, are, you know, are the models perfect, um, but are they better uh, and faster than, than human annotators? And a lot of that has just been um, being very humble about our own uh, ability to correctly annotate these images and that you do have uh, experts that disagree. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't, I shouldn't, I think, set the bar too high for, for AI at this point for, for some of those really difficult classification problems. I'd say briefly, the issue we have in medicine is not, it's not so much about data quality because I think a lot of the data that's used in medical centers is actually pretty high quality. It's standardization. It's the fact that you have different centers using different standards, different ways to store the data. And when you want to merge, you know, these data into individual data sets, you have to essentially uh, address, you know, this heterogeneity. And that's a major issue. That's why, you know, certain types of cohorts like UK Biobank are so helpful because everything is very standardized. And so that's, you know, once you have that kind of data in that kind of format, you can really learn predictive models really, you know, really well and efficiently. But, you know, in, in uh, systems like, you know, the U.S. system, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of, uh, you know, different standards being used by different hospitals. And that slows down the adoption and utilization of AI. So in robotics, the data quality ties a lot in the in terms of um, mismatch between simulator and real world. Because simulator never captures exactly how the real world works. And so a lot of the work these days is focused on how to somehow learn something in a simulator, because it's easy to scale up, but then still have it be relevant for the real world. There's a lot of progress being made, but still a lot more to be done. Very good. Okay, one more question, because I'm tasked with keeping this uh, pretty much on time, so please.
Yeah, maybe I can just comment on this. It's connected to your question we had earlier. You know, we actually are exposed to this kind of issue, for example, in, in some types of brain cancers where, you know, the patient population for those brain cancers is very small. So it's very hard to learn predictive models, you know, given the small populations of so, you know, patients, we don't have a lot of data to learn. And that's where, frankly, you know, AI is actually playing a major role because uh, a key sort of change in AI, you know, what's led to a revival of AI has been the concept of transfer learning. This idea that you can pre-train models based on you know, a large number of images that are not necessarily related to medicine, you know, in our case, trained on you know, images of mountains and cats and dogs, trained to recognize you know, fundamental sh you know, features of images, you know, the shapes, the textures, you know, the lines, the circles, the, you know, the fundamental things, the things that the brain does really well in terms of finding patterns. Uh, you know, the utilization of these pre-trained models has actually completely radically changed uh, you know, the field of AI. And you know, we see that in brain tumors, for example, where we are able to uh, pre-train, uh, let's say, in pathology, histology analysis, where we pre-train models based on uh, normal brain uh, histology slides, which we have in high abundance. And then we, once we have those pre-trained, it actually doesn't take a lot of data to retrain these models to be able to uh, predict certain things with small amounts of data for a specific application. Uh, so I think this is, you know, an example of application of AI to these kind of small populations that I think has a lot of potential. In addition to what Olivier said, one of the emerging areas of artificial intelligence is what is known as K-shot learning. So how you can lo learn with a small set of K cases up to the point of one-shot learning. Um, this is a hot area where many groups are working on in terms of algorithmic innovation in that space. So we expect to see a lot more happening. Okay. So th thank you all and uh, a round of applause for our panelists and speakers. <laughs>